Hey guys, today's video is going to be my weekly bread baking routine. This is sort of like a sourdough 101. I'm gonna be showing you how I make a sourdough loaf and also sourdough bagels. This is something I do every single week. I absolutely love being able to make a fresh bread and I'm so excited to share this with you. Before we get any further though, we really need to do a little bit of a disclaimer here because I only learned how to make sourdough a couple of months ago and I know that there are so many things that I'm probably doing wrong. And I can imagine in a year or two, I'm gonna look back on this video and cringe so hard because I made so many mistakes. So I just wanna put that out there right now that this is just coming from a total newbie and if you have any advice, if you're totally experienced and you wanna leave a comment and let me know what I'm doing wrong by all means, but I get this question so often because I'm always sharing all of my different sourdough creations on social media. People are always asking me how to make sourdough. So I thought it'd be fun to just do a very basic video sharing with you my routine so that I can actually share that video with people who ask me that question. So yeah, keep that in mind though. I'm not an expert, but I do love making sourdough. So whatever flaws I might have, hopefully I make up for it with passion. <laughs> okay, so first things first, you're going to need a sourdough starter. Now we're gonna make dough in a second and then I'll show you how I feed this. But the key to any successful sourdough is a healthy sourdough starter. You can get your starter anywhere. People sell it on Etsy, you can get it dehydrated. The one that I'm currently using is from Ballerina Farm and it's really, really good. It just takes a few days to bring it back to hydration. But after that, this has been going for months and it is so easy to keep alive and I absolutely love it. You can also get sourdough starter from a friend. If you know someone who is making sourdough, just ask them to fill a little jar up for you of their starter and you'll be good to go. I feel like that's the most fun way to start making sourdough. So I'll tell you a little bit more about my tips for starter in a moment, but let's start off by making some dough. All right, so let's make some dough. The recipe I'm gonna be sharing with you today is the exact same for both my loaf and my bagels. I've just experimented with all the different sourdough bagel recipes out there and I really prefer this combination of ingredients. So by all means, experiment and use whatever amounts and concoctions that you prefer. That's what's so fun about sourdough is that you can really tailor it to your taste preferences. So first thing you're going to need is a nice big bowl, ideally bigger than this one, but this is the only other big bowl that I have because the other ones are occupied with dough that I made last night that we're gonna be using in a moment. Then you're going to need a scale. You do not wanna skip on this. This is so, so important. You can get a cheap scale for like $12 on Amazon. I would highly, highly recommend this. So you're gonna turn your scale on and set it to grams. Then pop your bowl onto the scale and then you're gonna do what's called like a zeroing or tear just to make it back down to zero. Okay, so now we're ready to start compiling our ingredients. First thing you're gonna need is a nice and active, healthy starter. I made this last night, and as you can see from the elastic, it pretty much doubled in size. It's a little bigger this morning, but it'll still work just fine. So we are going to use 150 grams of starter. You can do more, you can do less. I've seen recipes with only 100 grams. I've seen recipes with 200 grams. It really is just down to your preference. So experiment and have fun. Then we're gonna add 255 grams of water to the bowl. Take your time with this because you don't want to pour too much. I always do a little bit, check the scale and then pour a little more. Another tip I have for you is to make sure your water is room temperature or slightly warm. Definitely not hot, but I find whenever I use cold water, it is does not turn out nearly as good. So definitely keep your water slightly warm. And then you're just gonna whisk it. Now I'm using a dough whisk that I literally only got yesterday. <laughs> this is my first time using it but I can see why they promote it. Wow, this is so much quicker. If you don't have this, just use a fork. It takes a little bit longer, but you can totally, like I said, I literally only got this yesterday. You do not need a dough whisk, but wowzers, that is so much more efficient. So I can understand <laughs> why they say to use this. Okay, so you wanna whisk the starter and the water together. And now these two next ingredients are completely optional. When I first started making sourdough bread, I did not use either of these, but over time I've just decided that it makes it taste so much better, so I like to use it. So we're gonna add 10 grams of salt. I'm a little bit of a daredevil just pouring straight from the giant mason jar. And then we're also gonna add 30 grams of sugar. Most bread that you buy at the store has sugar in it and I swear it just, just tastes so much better. But again, completely optional, it is really not necessary. And then lastly, we need to add some flour. We're gonna do 500 grams. This is bread flour. If you don't have bread flour, you can just do all purpose flour. That also works really well. Now, normally at this point, I just plug it into my KitchenAid, use the dough hook, and I'll knead it for a couple of minutes. But I wanted to show you guys how to do this by hand just in case you don't have a KitchenAid. It's a lot easier with the KitchenAid, but it is not necessary. So we're gonna get messy. Make sure your hands are clean. And actually, I would recommend just making sure they're a little bit damp. That's gonna help to prevent it from sticking too much to your fingers. All right, 
wet, clean hands and we're just going in. And you're just gonna start mixing. Just kind of folding it over. I don't really know of any fancy techniques here, although there probably are plenty, <laughs> but I haven't gotten that far. You can do this first part actually with a spoon. Normally I do that. I don't know why I went right in with my hands. It's been so long since I've done this by hand, but you can also do it completely by hand. It's really not that big of a deal. Just trying to combine everything evenly together. And it's gonna kind of feel like you're not making any progress for a while and like nothing is just, it's just not gonna work. But I promise just keep chugging away keep folding and rolling and whatever this kind of motion is needing almost. And eventually your dough will be nice and combined. It just does take a while. And your hands are gonna be covered in dough. It's all part of the process. Just relax and enjoy. This is one I would definitely recommend. You have some form of entertainment and you already have it turned on because you're not gonna be wanting to touch your phone or your TV or anything right now. Your hands are this covered. All right, so now our dough is very loosely combined and now we're gonna leave it covered for about half an hour so that it can auto lies. I cannot for the life of me remember what that actually means. I know that I read it somewhere, but I find it just really helpful because it, the dough kind of starts to get really hard to incorporate and work with. So I like to leave it for half an hour and then when I come back to do some more folding and kneading, it is so much easier to work with. So we're just gonna leave it for now. All right, and while we're waiting for our dough, let's go ahead and feed our starter so that we can make some more bread later today or tomorrow. So I've got the jar here. And if you look online, most people are gonna tell you to use a fresh jar every single time, but I'm telling you, I'm kinda of lazy. And I only really do a fresh jar every two or three times. So because last night, this is a fresh jar from yesterday, I am not gonna put it in a new jar, but um, maybe there's a reason and I should be doing that. <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, I just get too lazy because cleaning these jars is really annoying, which actually, side note, the biggest life hack that I found recently for cleaning sourdough jars or bowls is this metal, it's kind of wet, but this metal chain scrubber thingy-majig. I got this to clean my cast iron pan, which works amazing, but I was so surprised at how easy this makes cleaning sourdough as well, because sourdough is kind of like baked on cheese. It's really sticky and really, really hard to get off anything. It covers your sink. It's just so messy. So I found using this makes it so, like so much easier. I think this is like $10 on Amazon. I would highly recommend something like this. But anyways, yeah, like I was saying, I'm a little too lazy to always clean out my jars. So I'm just gonna use it with the jar, for the amount that's still in here. There's about 40 grams. It's just usually how much I would recommend you start if you were gonna pour this into a fresh jar, do 40 grams of this starter mixture. And then to that, we're gonna add some water and some flour that's feeding it. So if I were to be making a fresh batch of dough tonight, then this is the amount that I would be using because you wanna make sure that you have at least 150 grams of starter to make your next batch. So I like to do 80 grams of flour because you want your next batch and then a little bit left over. So I like to do 80 grams of flour, making a big mess here. And then also 80 grams of warm water. Then mix it all up. I like to move the elastic band to where it starts so I can see how much it's grown, but that's totally optional. You don't really need to do that. And then just cover it with a lid. And then you're gonna leave this on your countertop to rise and get nice and bubbly again before you make any fresh dough. If you find that your starter is not rising and not getting bubbly, there's a couple of things that might be happening for you because this happened to me in, at the beginning. So first of all, using warm water, I'm telling you that is a game changer. It really, really helps. You also wanna keep your starter jar somewhere warm. So it's the winter here for me right now and it is freezing in this house. We keep it at about 68 degrees and our heating bill is still way too expensive. But your starter is gonna be happiest between 70 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So because of that, you're gonna to wanna to try to find a nice warm place in your house if your house is cold like me. So that might be on top or next to your refrigerator. That might be next to the floor register the heating register or another thing that also works really well for me is putting it in the oven with the light on so whatever you need to do to keep your starter nice and happy and one other thing about the starter if like me you only really bake once or twice a week i really usually do a big batch of bagels and bread one time a week because it just saves a lot of time and then right now i'm experimenting trying to make croissants so i usually bake maybe twice a week but during those other days if you don't if you're not constantly feeding your starter, it's gonna die on you basically. Like it really needs to be fed every every 12 hours. Really, once it gets nice and bubbly, it wants to be fed, whether that means turning it into a loaf or feeding it, it's kind of needy. And if like me, you're not baking all the time, you don't really wanna have to be feeding it every single day. It's kind of a waste of flour. So what I like to do is just keep mine in the refrigerator. So instead of feeding it like we just did right now, if I wasn't gonna make anything else today, I would just literally pop it back in the refrigerator, assuming there's enough left over. 
Otherwise I'd feed it first, let it bubble, and then put it back in the refrigerator. And then I'll just literally leave it until I need it again. So say next time I wanna make some bread, the day before I would take it out in the morning and feed it right away. Let it bubble up throughout the day and then make my dough at nighttime. But I literally, that's all I do. Keeping it in the fridge will save you so much time. I would highly suggest doing it if, again, like me, you're not baking all the time. Okay, it's been about 45 minutes, so let's check on our dough. And I'm just gonna go ahead and continue to knead it a little bit more now. You can see it's, oh, it's already so much more, I don't know, like gooey and just easier to work with. Get that last little bit of flour from the bottom combined. And now this is where you're gonna wanna try to knead it as best you can, which again, is just this kind of motion of, you know, like lifting the side and punching it. <laughs> Kneading, I don't know, I'm not a professional. This is just what I think kneading is. <laughs> and yeah, you're gonna wanna knead it for a couple of minutes. You don't need to go crazy. The longer the better. Like if you can do it for eight minutes, by all means, if you can only last two minutes, I sometimes get really lazy and I only do two minutes and it's fine. So <laughs> as long as it's all combined, the kneading is just gonna really help to strengthen the dough. After you are happy with your kneading, you're going to cover it again and wait another half an hour. Okay, our dough is in resting for 30 minutes. Now I'm gonna show you guys really quickly how to do a stretch and fold, it's called. So all you're gonna do is grab one end of your dough, lift it up a little bit, and fold it over. Then spin it clockwise, or is that counterclockwise? I don't know, just spin it one way. <laughs> grab the next side, lift it again, give it a nice little shaky shake and then fold it over. And then just continue that four times all the way around your dough. And then you're just gonna cover it. And at this point, you can continue to do another couple stretches and folds, at least waiting 30 minutes in between. Most recipes say you can do it up to four times. Again, 30 minutes in between each stretch and fold that I just did. Personally, I never do that. I only do it the one time, because usually I'm making dough late at night, and at this point, I'm just ready to go to bed. And so I only do it the one time and I'm kind of lazy, but you can absolutely do it the full four times by all means. This is a great way to just strengthen the gluten in the dough and just make it stronger and, and healthier and just make it better. But you don't have to, and I definitely don't. So once you're done with your stretches and folding, you're going to leave your dough to rise. This is gonna take anywhere from eight to 12 hours. It kinda depends how warm your house is. If it's closer to the 80 degrees Fahrenheit, this is gonna rise a little bit quicker. The warm air really activates the bacteria and makes it just gobble everything up or whatever exactly it does. <laughs> it really speeds up the process. Whereas again, where I live, it's freezing. So this takes about 12 hours. If I do wanna speed the process, again, I'll try to put it somewhere warm in my house, usually just in the oven with the light on. But yeah, I usually just leave this on the counter. I'll make it at night, leave it on the counter. And by morning when I get back from the gym, it's ready for me to start baking. But of course, for this video, I actually pre-made two batches of dough so that I can show you the process right now and we don't have to wait until tomorrow. So let's get into it. Okay, now let's get to the fun part. We're gonna start baking. We're gonna start off with the bagels because they take a little bit longer. So this has been sitting on the counter overnight. I just had it covered with a damp tea towel and now it is ready to bake. Just gonna sprinkle a little bit of flour down here just to prevent sticking while we work with the dough. And I'm just gonna scoop the dough out onto our floured surface here. So now for bagels, I really like mine to be ginormous New York style bagels. But if you like more normal sized bagels, then cut this up into eight. But I like to only cut it up into six even pieces because I like them really nice and big and juicy. But again, do whatever you prefer. So you can be fancy and get one of those bread divider knife thingies. I don't know what they're called, but I just use a good old fashioned knife and I just try my best to cut it evenly. So I cut it in half and then I cut each half into thirds. And keep this flour handy because this dough is quite sticky and you're gonna you're gonna want it. So then what I like to do, and again, I don't know if this is like the professional way, but this is just what I do, is I kind of fold them in and make it into a little, little ball, a little dough ball, like so. And then I use my nails to make a little hole in the middle. And you're gonna wanna really, really extend that hole and make it a little bit bigger than you would think a bagel needs because this is still so active. The dough hole kind of closes up as you let it sit. So I always make the hole a little bit bigger than you would think you actually need. Like that's huge, trust me. Once you actually come to bake it, it's gonna be a lot smaller. And then just continue doing that exact same process of folding it over into a little dough ball and then making a hole for every single piece. And this might seem like a little tedious, but honestly, 
it's really fun, especially you put on some music or you have someone to talk to as you're doing this. It can be just so therapeutic. This was one of the reasons why I love making my own bread. It's just something about forming the dough and playing with dough. It's just, it's like Play-Doh, I guess, but for adults and it's so much fun. All right, now you're gonna need a baking tray and a non-stick mat or parchment paper. This is a very well-loved non-stick mat. I don't know about you guys, I swear I clean it and it just still gets so dirty and never looks clean after a while, but it'll do the job. So you're gonna just pop your bagels evenly placed along your baking tray. And then you're gonna cover it with a damp tea towel. Now damp tea towel is key. Same thing with when you leave your dough overnight. Otherwise it's gonna dry out. Mine actually dried it a little bit because the tea towel does you know, dry overnight and I left it a little too long, but it'll still work totally fine. But yeah, you want it to stay nice and um, protected from the air so it doesn't dry out. And we're gonna leave it for an hour. If you're in a hurry, leave it for just 30 minutes, it'll be fine. But this is just gonna allow the dough to do a little bit more rising so that our bagels are extra puffy and delicious. All right, now the bagels are chilling. Let's get started on the loaf. So I've got my dough here in this mixing bowl. And as you can see, it is so ginormous and jiggly and just amazing, the perfect dough. So let's get started. So onto our floured cutting board, I'm just gonna scoop out the dough. And don't worry if it's like totally sticking to the inside of your bowl, that happens. That's why people will use a proofing basket, I think it's called, where it's lined with fabric, or you can just spray it, coat it with some oil, or you can just deal with it being a little sticky. It's really not that big of a deal. And then I like to just do one last little fold and kind of shape it to a nice, loaf ball like so flip it over and then i kind of tuck the ends underneath so it's a nice little beautiful beautiful little dough ball now we're gonna take a cast iron pan or skillet or whatever these are called you can spray this with oil you can cut out a little parchment paper circle or i've got these little circular non-stick mats that i always use and then we take our dough ball and we're gonna pop it right on in there okay now i'm gonna cover it and we're gonna leave it to rise for another hour, another half an hour, however much time you have really. We're just gonna leave it. Um, if you are maybe in a hurry, you don't have time to bake it right now, you can just leave it like this and put it in the fridge and wait till tonight or later on in the day and bake it then. So you have a little bit of flexibility in terms of timing. Okay, so it's been about an hour. I'm gonna check on our loaf now. As you can see, the dough has risen and expanded a little bit, which is really nice. So now we're ready to put it in the oven. Before we do that though, we just need to do a couple of cuts on the top. So I'm just gonna add a sprinkling of flour. And now we're gonna do some cuts along the top of the loaf. This is kind of the signature thing you see with sourdough loaves is this beautiful intricate cutting that makes it just look so pretty afterwards. But this is not just for aesthetic purposes, it's actually like really essential to the whole sourdough process because the dough has been fermenting and there's a lot of air inside. And when it bakes, it really needs some holes and some space for the air to evaporate. So this is really key. You can use a bread lame or is it lame? I literally do not know. I've never tried to say it before, but use one of these thingies to cut it or you can use a knife. Now professionals will tell you, you need one of these and not a knife, but I didn't have this for the longest time and using a knife seemed to do the job. So I'm gonna do really simple, a nice cut all the way through. Oh, another thing you're supposed to do, I totally forgot, is to dip this in water. It will help it to not drag so much. So I like to do one and then maybe just another. Super simple today. We're not gonna get very fancy. I'm not very good at doing cool cutting yet. But yeah, you wanna at least do one nice deep cut I don't know, like a quarter inch or so into the loaf. That's really important to help the air evaporate. Now I'm gonna pop the lid on and we're gonna put this in the oven at 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And then traditionally you're gonna do it for 20 minutes to get the lid off and cook for an additional 40. Personally, I like to do 30 with the lid on, 30 with the lid off because I don't like the crust being super, super crunchy and I find that that kind of helps. But if you wanna to stick to the normal recipes, it's usually 20 with the lid on, 40 with the lid off. So I'm just gonna put this in the oven. All right, and now we're gonna get started making our bagels. Before we can put these in the oven, we need to boil them for a couple of minutes first. The reason we do this is so that they can keep their shape. Sourdough really loves to rise and expand, and because we're putting it in the oven just on this tray, there's nothing to kind of hold it in its shape we need to do a little bit of pre-cooking beforehand and that's where the boiling comes in. So I've got a large pot here that's just about boiling. We'll let it sit for another minute. And in the meantime, we're gonna add a little bit of, oh, normally I would add honey, but I ran out of honey, I just remembered. So we're gonna use a little bit of sugar, but either will work. I usually do like a nice big dollop 
of honey, but instead we'll do a little bit of sugar today, no worries. I'm actually not really sure what the point of the sugar is. I feel like it just kind of makes the bagels a little bit sweeter and kind of shinier, but there might be a reason. I haven't actually looked into that. You're gonna want some sort of open spoon. I don't know what these are called, but it's a large cooking spoon that has some holes. This is important because when we scoop the bagels out, we need to be able to drain the water so we're not bringing the water with them. All right, the water is officially boiling, so I'm just gonna take a bagel. I like to give it one last shaping, especially trying to make the hole a little bit bigger because it always kind of closes up as it sits. And then you're just gonna pop it right into the pot. Now, my pot is big enough that I can usually do about three in one go. After about 30 seconds, you're gonna take your bagel out and just flip it and put it back in the water so it cooks the other side. And then after another 30 seconds or so, just take it out, let the water strain through, and pop it back onto your baking mat. And then we're just gonna repeat that process one more time with the rest of the bagels. And the longer you boil them, the bigger they get. So I left these ones in a little bit longer than the first batch, and they are a little bit bigger, but we like that. We like that around here. And now at this point, you can add any of your desired toppings to the bagels. So that can be sesame seeds, or I guess some people do like cheese and jalapeno. There's actually so many things that you can do. So have fun with that. I have been really loving this everything bagel seasoning that I got at the grocery store. It's a mixture of sesame seeds, poppy seeds, garlic flakes, onion, and salt. It's really, really good. And I'm just trying to use it up. So I'm gonna pour the rest of this here into a bowl, normally you would wanna use a little bit more. This is probably only enough for one bagel, but I like to put it into a little bowl like this. And then you take the bagel and you're just gonna dip it into the bowl and try to coat the top with the whatever topping that you're using, like so. And there really was only enough for one. Usually I like to try to do half and half, but that's totally fine. Now they're ready to finally go into the oven. And I just put that in the rack below the bread that's already cooking. So now for the bagels, I usually like to cook them for about 30 minutes. Usually at the 30 minute mark at least, I'll check on them and then I might cook them for another five minutes. I just really don't like mine to be super crunchy. I don't like super crunchy crusts apparently. So usually at 30 minutes, I'll check on them, but you could cook them for another 10 minutes probably. Just kind of keep an eye on them and cook them to your preference. All right, it's been 30 minutes. So I'm gonna take the bread out of the oven, take the lid off and then put it back in. Check out how much it rose already. It's looking beautiful. We'll put it back in for another 30. Oh, look at that beautiful loaf. Oh my gosh, she's beautiful. <laughs> All right, so I like to leave my loaf in the cast iron pan for at least 10 minutes because it's just really hot. I don't want to mess with it right now. Then I'll put it on a cooling rack like I have the bagels on at the moment. And you want to let it sit for an hour before you start cutting. And typically for me, same thing with the bagels, I really love to just slice it all up and put it in a plastic bag in the freezer. That way I have bread whenever I need it and I know it's gonna keep fresh. Originally when I first started doing this, especially with the bagels, I would just put them in a plastic bag and leave them on the counter. They were still airproof, but I definitely found after just a couple of days, they were not as fresh tasting. They kind of were a little bit on the stale side. And I think that's probably because bread you get at the store has a lot of preservatives, which help to keep it nice and fresh. Whereas the ones that we're making at home do not. And so after a few days, they're just not nearly as good. So I find putting them in the freezer, taking them out maybe the night before, like usually the bagels, my boyfriend has one every morning. So I put them all into a freezer bag and then the night before I'll take one out and I put it in that little clear case thing. <laughs> I'm trying to point to it, can you see there? I'll put it in there to let it defrost throughout the night and then it's ready in the morning. And I'll just do that every single day. I find it so much easier than having to worry about the bagels not tasting as good. And then same thing, like I said, with the bread, I slice it all up, put it in the freezer and whenever I need it, I will just, I'll just take it out and I'll pop it in the toaster and it's ready to go. Also, really wish you guys could smell how good it smells in here right now. Nothing beats the smell of fresh bread. If you have never done this before and you try it out, you are gonna literally die over how amazing your house smells. All right, so that's everything for this video. That is my entire weekly bread baking routine. I really hope you found this video helpful. I was really nervous, like I said, to do a video like this because I am not an expert. And I know that there's probably going to be a lot of experts watching this. They're just cringing at all the things I do wrong. But I really wanted to share my routine with you guys because I love making bread and I really want to share that love with you guys. If you are totally new to the world of sourdough and this felt quite overwhelming, definitely know that you're not alone and you can absolutely do it. When I first started trying to figure out sourdough, I can't explain how 
I mean, it wasn't stressful, but sort of. Like, I really could not figure it out. The amount of failures that I had, but eventually you get the hang of it. And it really is all part of the process. So just stick with it. Keep on trying. Don't give up. And you will be surprised by the amazing bread creations that you can make. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already. Leave a comment and let me know if you currently make sourdough bread or if you're thinking about trying it. Be sure to follow me on my other social media platforms. I'm at Growing with Gwen on Instagram. And I'm also on TikTok, Gwen the Milkmaid. Thank you again so much for watching this video and I will see you again next Thursday.